Thanks, Cole, for that introduction. So really, I just want to set the stage here for what we're doing with uh, Collabor Online. Uh, I think there's some, some amazingly uh, interesting things going on. Um, and I'm going to leave most of that to, uh, to my very talented staff. Um, so before we get there, I'd just like to talk briefly about what is uh, Collabora and, and what, what we're doing, where, where, all, where all this comes from. So, um, well, if you, if you didn't know, uh, Collabora is a 140 plus person uh, open source consultancy, and it's our, our parents' company, really. Um, so it's got a long experience of doing all sorts of amazing things. I'll show you a flavor of that in a second. Um, probably the most interesting thing about them is that their whole purpose, their raison d'etre, as, as my, uh, my co-business uh, partner, Philippe, would say, um, is to accelerate the adoption of open source technologies, uh, those methodologies and philosophies that we, we love and that are so powerful of building uh, amazingly, amazingly rich software uh, in, in community and with, with other people and so on. So Collabora Productivity is a subsidiary there that's half owned by Collabora and half owned by myself. It was spun out of SUSE in 2013. We're now around eight years old and we have 32 staff and we're fully focused as a subsidiary on office productivity. So that's, that's our, our driving uh, goal, uh, improving that for our clients. So um, Collabora, the parent company, does lots of different things. Um, and I'll just give you a very brief flavor of that. You can see some of these things. But the thread that runs through all of these things is essentially enabling our customers to use open source to the maximum, uh, you know, to, to get their hardware working, get their embedded car systems or their digital signage or their, all of these sort of interesting OEM products from the medical equipment beside your bed running on an open source stack from the bottom up. So, you know, we build uh, Linux drivers, enablement, uh, you know, we make, make graphics work and, and we, we help build people build rich, rich products on a, open source, an increasingly powerful open source base. So everything, everything Collabora does is open source, and the same is true for Collabora Online. We, we don't do anything proprietary. So, so what is what is Collabora Online? In case you've crept in here and, uh, and don't know, I'll just do a quick, uh, quick take uh, so that the rest of the talk might not seem so confusing. Um, so we do uh, word processing, spreadsheets and diagrams, uh, presentations as well, I guess. And uh, we put that inside your browser. Uh, so we can deliver this from a server, uh, to any any device that runs a browser. In addition, and that's really the tip of the spear for us as, as a product, is getting that uh, web-based, uh, browser-based, uh, mobile, and uh, you know, of course, it runs on your mobile phone as a responsive uh, interface. It's really getting that into people's hands. Of course, in addition, we run it actually natively uh, on iOS, Android, Chrome OS, and of course, your PC. We have a PC a version of Collabor Office. But really, today we're here to talk about the online uh, version. And one of the things I'd love to stress is that a key part of the value here is the excellent interoperability of Microsoft formats. Uh, you know, I was on the uh, ECMA committee that helped standardize Microsoft's new, I guess they're a decade plus old now, um, open XML file formats are really based on uh, the, the previous work done by OpenOffice, LibreOffice's precursor that sits underneath us. And it's great, you know, great to have, have that experience of, uh, of, of seeing interoperability uh, close up and working with people across the industry there. And we really do have the most mature code base uh, for, for doing this out there. Um, we like to produce Collabor Online. We sell support and services around it, and we brand that, uh, obviously. Uh, but we also have a, a development edition, I, I guess the Fedora um, for our Red Hat Enterprise Linux, if that's an analogy that works for you. Um, we have around 70 million Docker image downloads there, about 2.2 million a month we ship, and that's growing. Uh, and it's great to see, and of course, each of those is an unknown number of users out there uh, using those servers to collaborate around documents, which, which is great. So that's the product, really. But I just want to talk less about product features and more about uh, the benefits for customers uh, and users. And those really fall into three pieces uh, today. So safe, um, powerful, and flexible. So I'd like to just get through those. So keeping your data safe. Um, so there are many ways of looking at this. I think the, the old characterization is uh, a lock-in um avoiding locking but but i'd like to um talk more in a positive way about digital sovereignty you know giving you control of your data uh not just your data um obviously your data is really important and there's a lot of legislation around it um but also your compute and your network and your storage where it is what cloud it's in whether it's hybrid you know or, or you know out, out there on the internet or locally in your uh, data center under your control 
And unfortunately, there are many, many trends in our, in our history and uh, you know, where we've been uh, that would suggest that people are really trying to lock you in uh, and reduce your sovereignty uh, so that you can't choose you know, suppliers, vendors, you know, and, and you have limits, really limit your choices in, in that stack. Historically, documents, um, I think, along with third party applications, I mean, there, there are big network effects from the Windows API. Um, but I think a huge part of this was documents with tangled content um, that would tie users just to one platform. Uh, you know, you had to use Microsoft Office to, to be able to collaborate. And often, you know, you had to use just one version of it, you know, and you had to get your whole organization to pull up to the latest version uh, all at the same time. Um, otherwise, you simply couldn't collaborate with other people. And that really tied enterprises to Microsoft Windows very, very uh, tightly. And so historically, there was this network effect of documents and uh, Windows and APIs all, all sort of going in this knotty bundle. I think over time, you know, the web has provided a great way to migrate many of those uh, enterprise applications to the web. Um, so they're no longer tied to a platform. Uh, they're no longer dragging you back to, to somewhere you don't necessarily want to be. Um, but unfortunately, of course, the office document piece is still one of the, the key knots to untie there in terms of getting out of that uh, stranglehold. So, um, of course, today we have a slightly different world where there's the, the promise of, you know, putting your documents online and having your data, uh, you know, in, in a cloud somewhere. Um, but of course, ideally, you should also have your authentication and your Active Directory hosted in the cloud somewhere. And you should make sure all your documents are encrypted uh, individually with a rights management server, but you should also store all of your keys uh, in the cloud and tie all of those into this uh, rights management system. And uh, you, know, you should run Office 365 for collaboration, as it were. So, um, so this, I guess, is, is probably just a new variant of an old, old scheme. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, from, from closed file formats uh, to making it virtually impossible to migrate away from this. Um, but, but previously, at least you had all the data on your on site. You know, it, it was yours. You, you, could, you could actually see it. You know, and all, although the software might not, not be yours, you, know, you, you had your data and your documents. Of course, uh, these days, you know, big companies are really very, very helpful at offering you know, an easy way to visit your uh, locked in, imprisoned data uh, on, on their terms. Uh, but, but really, it's it, it looks pretty sinister. We, so what we really want to do is we want to give you the power of the cloud, because I think the benefits of the cloud are really, really clear and obvious around deployment, around you know, upgradability and maintenance. Uh, and, and we want to give our users uh, the ability to uh, control their data and regain that digital sovereignty. And why is that? Well, I think the problems of these monster, homogeneous, one-size-fits-all clouds are really pretty clear. I think there is a ticking time bomb here um, that, is, that is really a, yeah, it's going to create a, a huge problem uh, for, for us all. Uh, we know that nation state actors are able to get into these environments. Uh, we've seen, you know, the solar winds. I mean, wh whether that's because they're hosted in a nation state and they have a legal right, or whether it's because they're just uh, skilled hackers and they can get in. And uh, we saw recently uh, this, this problem, the solar winds hack and all of the, the source code for these cloud services, you know, inside most companies being, being opened up. I mean, Microsoft talks about not being frightened because they have an inner source model. Well, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so so the, the, when we've open sourced software, and I, I've worked with a number of large companies with, with very well deployed products, the amount of cleansing and uh, security review and hard work that is necessary to do to upgrade your software to make it possible to open source it without compromising your customers was very, very significant. And uh, so it's interesting to now now see this stuff sort of opened before its time, but not to everybody, so that they can provide the benefit of scrutiny and uh, security improvements, but only to the bad actors who, who've got in there. And, and behind these, this homogeneous security environment, behind these uh, one set of locked doors, you know, is the mother load of all interesting uh, documents. The incentive to get in there is so high uh, that the, the likelihood of being caught up in this dragnet of, you know, as people break in there is, is well, I, I would argue very problematic. And, and we see this in terms of Windows versus Mac security. I, mean, I think Mac security is probably a little bit higher. They have a slightly less strange and unhelpful uh, model. You know, they have proper security model built in the operating system. But I think the Mac uh, people have benefited very largely from having a, a less widely used uh, operating system. I think just 
having that huge deployment of Windows out there previously has made it much easier or just much more of a target uh, for people. And so I think as you go down to a more, you know, a less, less used operating system, interestingly, often uh, the security improves there. So, so what do we do with all of this data? You know, we've got to put our data somewhere. So some people say end-to-end -end encryption is the solution. You know, we just need to en encrypt the data on the client and then send it to the cloud and they can't see it anyway. And then when we get it back, uh, we'll be able to see it and problem solved. Interesting. I mean, from a consumer perspective, this is this is probably quite interesting. For a, from, from a customer, if you really don't trust your cloud provider um, with your credit card information, your personal data, and so on, then, then that's fine. Um, you can encrypt your data and, and put it there, no problem. But as a business, do you really trust the devices in everyone's pockets, their laptops, their different operating systems that are distributed everywhere around the world more than keeping the data on the server in your data center? And so Miklos is going to talk later a bit about uh, you know, a secure view and how you can actually retain control not only of your compute and your servers, uh, but also that, that document data and not let it out of your site. And I commend his talk to you. Um, so instead, I think you know, we really want to be keeping control of our data. We want to be making sure it's somewhere safe and having that flexibility to choose how we do that. If you want to choose your own VPN, you can choose that. You, know, you, you can make sure that it's only accessible uh, over that. Uh, you can, if you're really paranoid, you can have multiple layers of VPN. If you're extremely paranoid, you can not only have multi-factor authentication, you can air gap your network. Uh, you know, so you can put it in a container on a battlefield. Why not? Uh, there's there's nothing, nothing you can't do. The flexibility is there. Or perhaps you know, you're not that paranoid, but you do want to know where your data lives, uh, who it's shared with. Um, who else is using the same machine in this wonderful time-sharing thing? You know, is there some a friendly row hammer, uh, you know, tester from North Korea uh, living on the same machine with you if they, uh, you know, rented a similar account on the European server you're using. And I think probably you want a local partner for support. I think in addition to that, one of the wonderful things about the ecosystem we work with our partners is that often they have these federated systems so that you can have one system that federates with another system, with another system. So actually you can have multiple different layers of security and access and you can then even collaborate and talk between them, um, between multiple vendors. So, so some very exciting stuff going on there. So you say, all of this sounds good, but really you want to make sure you're not sacrificing feature function. I think that's, that's vital. And so our vision for Collabor Online, uh, we're really focused on this, actually, just, just, to, um, just to make it clear. You know, we do try and do one thing. We try and do it really well, which is this, a collaborative document editing. We don't try and boil the ocean. We love to work with partners and we love to sell through partners because we really make one piece that does the document editing. We don't do document storage, we don't do authentication, uh, and we leave all of that to our partners because it's hard. Uh, and you know, we really value their expertise at getting that right and helping you deploy that. So what we're really focused on is a full feature Office Productivity Suite. It's open source. As I say, that's in our DNA. It's, it's who we are and uh, putting this in the browser to get really good quality browser-based document editing. And with, with interoperability, I think that that is really, you know, our executives want to play with their iPads and their Macs and their students get their, their Chromebooks and, you know, the researchers have the Linux system, but so, so on and so on. And some people have Windows and all of them want to be able to interoperate perfectly. And of course, putting this in the browser, putting it in the cloud makes that really transparent and easy. And we just really have the most mature implementation outside our Microsoft here. And we will talk to you a bit more about it. Why is full feature matter? Well, I, can, I would argue uh, that Microsoft Office Online is really just a, a disguised a version of trying to get you to uh, continue to use the PC Windows full feature client. You know, the, the fact thing. Use the full, full functionality on Windows in Word. Uh, to edit your document, you know, five megabyte file size limits, you know, I mean, some of these things are tweakable, but this is really, this is really not very impressive. You know, we can't show these features in the browser. Ironically, uh, you know, Microsoft is worse at interoperating with itself uh, than, than we are uh, with their documents. So I'll give you an example. Uh, lots of people have legacy forms to fill out. You know, they, they need to either create templates for merging or to fill out people's details in forms. Here's a random example from the internet. The New Zealand Customs Service, you know, your, your ship, your luxury yacht, uh, Larry Ellison has sailed into town. He has to fill out his form, right, to, uh, to dock his, his boat, or his, his minion does, let's say. And it's normal to have these forms, and you tab through them, and they have protected bits, so you can't edit the form. You can only edit the contents and so on. And here we see, well, there's two things to see here. The first thing is that Office Online can't do it. So 
bad luck, try using the desktop version uh, on, on Windows. Um, but also, it's amusing to me that the quality of, of what is being shown in your browser is, is just appalling. And there is a very low resolution uh, view of your document here. And worse than that, the view is actually uh, using what's, what's known as uh, clear type. Uh, so it's putting false color around these, these pixels for an LCD screen. And it's then interpolating it so as to smear this color out uh, horribly. And the net result is just, well, I mean, there's nothing clear about that type. I think it's worth, worth pointing out. So, um, well, so how do we do that? So, you know, clearly uh, we try and get it right. So we load the document, uh, we render it uh, properly. Uh, we have crisp text. Uh, you can tab through the fields, you can edit it, you can skip your protected sections and, and, you know, actually do the business that you're supposed to be doing online. So that's really just one example. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these from WYSIWYG document layout to, well, I mean, we should, we should you know, we, we could do a whole, whole talks on technical detail. And I, and I really don't want to get sucked into that. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's just quite something else uh, to see us doing so much better. Another key thing there, of course, is from a power base basis that we're built on this LibreOffice technology stack. You know, we have these 200 plus million people out there testing and using and are working, working with that uh, developer base, around 1,000 people helping to develop a LibreOffice, you know, very highly localized and, and often into to minority languages that no one else cares for. Uh, you know, so, so you can actually control the outcome there. And of course, it's developed in public, you know, the, the outer source uh, uh, that open source is. And, and, you know, because of that, you know, you can see these generals on the, uh, you know, fr from the Italian military here in the, the city of Rome, on Capitol Hill, very graciously hosting uh, our conference in Berlin, uh, the Federal Ministry of Economics and Technology, the people doing doing the work, meeting together and providing that that ecosystem that, that grows and, and makes this uh, much better. So we're very thrilled to contribute to LibreOffice. And then finally, I think the third thing, so we've had, you know, safe and powerful, and now I wanna talk about flexible, really the last, the last thing. So, so really you want flexibility. Uh, say, say pricing, licensing, when it, when it comes to pricing, it is not a one size fits all. Uh, you are a small business of only 10,000 users and, and you know, you get what you're given. You know, we have per user licensing. Of course, it's around 10% of the price of the competition. Um, but we also have site licenses, telco licenses, per connection licenses, not recommended, the competition do it. So we have a pretty nasty uh, thing that matches that. But, uh, you know, really tailoring that to your needs. You know, your customers don't pay for the first month on the hosting thing, so they have a trial month. Fine, we'll match that. We'll, we'll fit into your business model uh, or your needs uh, really, really beautifully. And of course, we have partner and OEM and reseller and direct. We, we prefer not to sell directly. Obviously, we love to go through our partners. So there's real flexibility there. And you know, we have salespeople that do a real job of understanding your needs and, and, and what's reasonable. Um, of course, from a flexibility perspective, we also you, give you control over the product. So you know, we have SLAs, of course, for availability, keeping your service running. Very important, that. And that comes as standard, obviously. Uh, but we also sell bespoke SLAs. If you want an engineer to start in a couple of days on fixing or improving some feature or problem that you have that's you know, very unique and uh, specific to you, um, well, we'll sell you an SLA for that and we'll, we'll prepay it so you know, that you have a defined price, so that you have essentially a small part of our engineering team that you can direct. Um, if you want a more complex thing, we can do bespoke feature development. Obviously, we, we really prefer to do that as part of a product management relationship. So we hear your problems and then we you know, just implement those in a scheduled way. But if you're really impatient, you, know, you want to accelerate this thing, you really want it, uh, we, can, we can meet your need there. And we have bespoke versions and white labeling so you can make the product your own and, and really embed it into your, your product. 230 partners, 58 countries, we, we, we're flexible, we're there in your language uh, to stand beside you. And then when it comes to deploying it, you know, where you deploy it, on your software, on your premise, uh, or in the cloud of your choice, I don't care, in, in a nuclear bunker, uh, and we'll be there to support you. Packages, Docker images, Kubernetes, any kind of orchestration you like. If you're particularly paranoid, you can build it from source code yourself, so you know exactly what, you know, there's absolutely no question what you're getting. Uh, we bundle high availability by default, extraordinarily configurable clustering, late balancing, the, 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 whole, the whole shebang is there. And you can choose how to do it uh, in your own time on your own hardware. So I'd love to have more time to talk uh, more deeply with you, but we're trying to get some quick talks here, just bite-sized pieces uh, to free up your time to get the most value out of this, uh, this, this time that you're giving us, we're grateful for. 
And so just laying out what we've got there. So Eloy is going to talk about how powerful uh, that, that combination of interoperability uh, you know, and support there for your enterprises. And, and these are some of my, you know, the, the senior guys. Eloy is leading our, our sales and business development engagement. I'm safe in the security side of this and how, how we work hard to make sure that you are kept safe. And um, that's from uh, Miklos, who leads our consultancy and, and our product uh, development team there. And then flexible, just how to set this up, how, how to make that, how to integrate it into, into your services and theme it and make it look attractive uh, for your use case. Uh, from, from Katie, who leads our product development team. And then we're going to have a panel from some of the real leaders uh, in this area of digital sovereignty and hopefully provide a more nuanced view of the, some of the compliance issues and so why you'd really want, you know, it's not just a good thing to control your, your workload. Luckily, governments are steering us in this direction and starting to mandate that. So it's actually, you know, almost required uh, to, to do this properly. And then we're going to look at some case studies of our partners um, actually doing this really well and, and showing how easily this can be done out there um, from, from a lot of different partners. And I'd recommend, you know, any one of these partners is fantastic. Uh, we love to surf beside them. And then we're also gonna have a talk about uh, the LibreOffice technology that we uh, build our product on top uh, from uh, the LibreOffice project. So thank you for joining us. I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your feedback and questions. I'd like to just call out two companies in particular, Arrowa uh, as a partner of ours and Scaleway, whose services we, we enjoy to use regularly of helping to sponsor the big blue button platform we're using now. And uh, yeah, with that, I'll and uh, yeah, with that, I'll hand over to uh, the next person, who I think is uh, Elwood.